Cloister e Last Standee. Hello and welcome to The Last Standee, a board game podcast coming to you from five exciting countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Alexis. Hi. Alessio. And welcome to The Last Standee, a board game podcast coming to you from five exciting countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Alexis. Hi. Alessio. Hello, hello. Audrey. Hey. David. Hey. And I'm your host, Fen. Uh, hello. Uh, we're going to be talking about a range of different topics ac across the hobby. And today we're going to start with a bit of a catch up because uh, we've been on a break for the holiday period and the new year. So how's everyone doing? Um, I'm doing pretty okay. I spent my new years with my family, uh, thankfully. And I got to play some uh, some board game as well as uh, I received uh, Dice Vault, which I'll tell you. Uh, overall, just doing okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, David? Yeah, I'm doing fine so far. Like, uh, we played um, on New Year's Eve, we played a bit of uh, Settler of Catan, which was like surprisingly fun this time because the walls were in my favor. <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, well, you know, we just have to wait and see. Alessio? Well, I actually got my Crokinol pledge for the Crokinol game, which is actually a piece of furniture, and mm. it is a great, great game. I it is. I actually got addicted. I, I've got a copy of myself, but it's still good as dexterity poolish type games go. Fantastic. Logistic between the uh, the UK and Europe. I'm guessing that's going to become a, an important topic in the coming weeks. Yeah, for me, it shouldn't be quite so difficult. It's just a matter of paying to get the stuff transported. But uh, there's, I have to wait for the money to arrive in the UK, and that's got a whole matter of paying to get the stuff transported. But uh, there's, I have to wait for the money to arrive in the UK, and that's got a whole other bunch of things waiting on it behind it. Uh, anyway, and um, uh, let's see, let's touch with Audrey. How's your uh, Christmas break been? Yeah, uh, it, it was great. We went uh, to visit the families, and we took our cat with us, and. Uh, anyway, and um, uh, let's see, let's touch with Audrey. How's your uh, Christmas break been? Yeah, uh, it, it was great. We went uh, to visit the families and we took our cat with us and he adapted perfectly at my parents. So that was a great thing. I finally converted my parents and especially my dad to board games. Woo! Dad to board games. Woo! I won! Because we took just two games with us. Five minute dungeon and we didn't play it. And Azul. I think that Azul blew everyone's mind, especially the, the dads. Both my boyfriend's dad and mine. That was great. <laughs> and now my parents are bye. Oh, that is, that's always nice. Yeah, m my dad, before that, he he'd only tried games of guessings and uh, visuals like Dixit, and he didn't catch uh, on them. So it's completely... Uh, Azul showed them a different type of games both to uh, to both dads and was really converted. I think that having something that's more concrete, that's more touchable in the game really helped him because he had uh, the tiles to manipulate and I think the games which have components to manipulate can make it easier than abstract games. Yeah, I, I think I agree in the games people talk about playing at Christmas, at least uh, in the UK, is Scrabble, which is tiles. And to go to Azul, you're just kind of like, well, this is a tile game, only you're playing with colours instead of letters, you know. Yeah, the first phase of the game is basically a drafting phase, but you're drafting just colours, colours. I think it's a really good introduction to the mechanic of drafting. I think that at some point I could go back to my parents and have another game and say, okay, you see these mechanics? That's what he's called usually drafting. You have a pool of resources and you draw from them in turns. That's what a draft is and of drafting. I think that's a really good introduction to that. And because it's simple, there, you don't have many turns, everything is open on the table, so yeah, you can chat while you're doing it. You can say, oh, okay, I'm doing this and I'm I'm drafting via from my board and everyone can see it compared to games where the draft is uh, hidden. So you can very easily have a first game where you take people by the hand and show them what you do. And of course, you always have the, the hardest thing with points. I, I think that in both families, that's what was a bit harder 
to get the fact that the tile you put on your board counts both horizontally and vertically. But once they had it figured out, they were like, oh, okay, so I'm going to fill this uh, slot on my board because... Uh -huh. uh, my experience with Azul is um, with st uh, stained glass of Sintra, um, mm -hmm. which is a little bit different in that you have these laid out strips and you're looking to fill those in to match the colours. Um, I'm looking at the Azul board now because I've not had a chance to play the original Azul. And yeah, it's that's quite a different tile lay mechanic. Not had a chance to play the original Azul. And yeah, it's that's quite a different tile lay mechanic. Yeah, when when the people know you can turn the boards and there is a second um, side where you can put the colors however you want, as long as each color is seen just once in every column and once in every line, once in every line. But uh, that's the other advantage of the game. You can be very progressive. Make one game just drafting and putting the tiles. Make one game drafting, putting the tiles, and then counting points, and etc. You can increase the level of depth of the game progressively. And I think that's very convenient, and which helped everyone have a good time. Having introductory drafting element is really nice, since plenty of games use those. Yeah, I, I know that my uh, sister, she has uh, Seven Wonders, the normal version, not the dual one. And uh, she tried to have our family play it, our family play it, and my dad didn't understand the draft at that point. But uh, Azul, maybe because it's not hidden, because you can see exactly what everyone does, made him understand the draft. And maybe I could go back to ne next time, when I go back, maybe... I can ask my sister to bring Seven Wonders and say, okay, you see, this is the draft and this is another kind of draft. And I think that's a really good yeah, introduction to it. You're right. Um, in Azul, is there a mechanic where if you get tiles, you can't place this score against you? Yes. There is. Oh, it's the same one. Yeah, because that's one of the mechanics I really liked in Stained Glass is if you take tiles and you in Stained Glass is if you take tiles and you can't place them all, you've broken those tiles and you have to um, put them on a broken glass track and it scores points against you at the end of the game, which I thought was um, a nice little kind of mechanic of where you can leave things that people don't really want to take. Yeah, I things that people don't really want to take yeah I, as we were all new to the game we didn't really uh, focus on oh i'm going to take this because i like it and someone will end with these styles that they don't want we didn't really look at that too much we were like i'm going to take this because i want it i don't care <laughs> But we were not actively trying to give negative points to the other. I think that also helped because it creates a mood in the game, uh, especially for newer players, that's a bit nicer. But for people that want to play hard, you have as well uh, a lever to pull. Mm -hmm. Someone completed their last line. First line. Yeah, so it is important to keep the point in check because... Uh, there is always someone who could then the, the more convenient time. So you you are actually pressed to you are pushed to have always a winning uh, always a winning uh, winning points in your hand. You cannot just store for a future which couldn't come. I always like that in games when the, the player can decide when the game ends, which gives a, a small amount of, uh, not bluff, but but at least some level of uh, inter-player, um, should I have, um, not bluff, but but at least some level of uh, inter-player, um, should I hand now or should I wait another turn? Uh, is that, that player going to end before me? Well, in the in, in Azul Classic, it's uh, yes and no on that, because technically the game ends when someone uh, finishes one five turns. So in theory, you could play six rounds, but generally someone ends up the game at five rounds. Yeah, exactly. You have to be real quick because there's some, there's always some someone putting pulling something nasty like ending the, the turn with, while you are still setting up your... Because it, it's uh, without it, without that form of player agency, people can sit there and go, well, well I'm just going to do this strategy at these beats and I know I've got this many turns to do this. And here it's sort of, if you see someone moving and lining up for something big, you can race your game and be like, well, I'm going to get a few less points, but you're going to get a lot less points, which keeps the game having depth and having depth for replays and getting experienced with it. 
it's nice to have that elasticity to the end. In game with uh, an engine building, which isn't like uh, like Azul, but uh, in uh, Race for the Galaxy, for example, I always think that it's kind of um, it's more interesting when there's a space when the the end is defined by the player rather than a interesting when there's a space when the the end is defined by the player rather than a specific ending. Uh, because it it forces player not to to play by the the game's tempo, but to um, to decide their own tempo between the player. It creates a more interesting meta, I think. Yeah. And in in Azul, uh, from what I heard, it's it's a game that creates a more interesting meta, I think. Yeah. And in in Azul, uh, from what I heard, it's it's a game that's. Uh, really interesting and dynamic. It is. I'm glad that uh, your family enjoyed it, uh, Audrey. Yeah, uh, one nuance that my boyfriend had to bring is that so each player has their own board, and you rate no you you, you keep track. Each player has their own board, and you rate no you. you you keep track of your points on your own board. And sometimes it can be a bit hard to look at other players' board to see, oh, how many points do you have now? And uh, after that, we bought the Azul Summer Pavilion, in which there is a common a board table, and everyone has their own tracker that they move on this board. And my boyfriend said that he thinks it's more convenient to see exactly who is leading, how much points you need to take back the lead, etc. And I think that's something that I agree on. I haven't uh, opened the box yet as I bought it just uh, just a week ago. I'm going to uh, do that very soon. And now my parents bought three other board games, uh, Queer Curls, Kaiju and Quatl. And just as Azul, they're doing introductory games. So with Quickle, I think they did just a first game to learn the rules, tiles. And then uh, they're going, they said that they are going to do soon another game, but where they will count the points. And my dad is asking for more. Yeah. Thank you, Azul. Thank you. Somebody who has, hasn't played Azul yet. I've seen there are like different versions or like uh, there's like summer pal. Which one would you like uh, recommend for beginners or like more advanced players? Right. So I've, uh, as I said, I've only played stained glass of Azul, and basically the way it goes is Azul's the simplest version of it. Um, stained glass adds a few extra wrinkles and difficulties. Um, summer is one that I've not had a chance to play. A Sintra is. Um, more than accessible enough but uh, if you're playing with people who haven't played much then just basic azul is a great uh, I, yeah i have a basic azul and i can say that it is actually a good entry point game everyone loves it so that's the right um, that's the right amount of complexity stained glass of sintra i think it has uh, changed scoring uh, differently from the basic casual yeah. so it's a good entry point too hmm. yeah it has yeah. the addition of a few extra mechanics like a glazier that sort of adds more thinking to it to, and yeah it has yeah. the addition of a few extra mechanics like a glazier that sort of adds more thinking to it to, and and a little bit more complexity without getting overly so um and uh, i personally prefer the stained glass aesthetic over the tile laying one mostly because uh, i really still want to eat the tiles in puzzle <laughs> in Azul. I just played the regular Azul uh, since I bought uh, Summer Pavilion just recently. But uh, what I would say is that from the chats that I've had online, the Summer Pavilion has a reputation to be more tactical and that you can um, that you can go really deep if the other players around the table know about board games and are used to playing board games and etc. So yeah, for the introduction, uh, it really seems that the standard one is the best one. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if you if you got uh, Azul. I don't know if you'd want both Stained Glass and Summer. I think you'd probably pick one, uh, two out of those three at most, really. Yeah. It, uh, I think most people agree maybe Azul for the first one, uh, except for me. I prefer Stained oh. Glass any day. Another thing that is probably worth mentioning is that the the action value is actually spot on. The, the components are really nice to look at and move around and touch. So yeah. that's a positive thing about the game. 
well, and also, also as you've you've just reminded me, it has at least stained glass does. I don't know about as all. It has a good inlay, which really matters for me. I care so much about stained glass. One holds everything well, and it doesn't slide around. So that's like a big tick in my book. That's a whole point out of ten for me. It's the the inlay of Azul Standard is basic, but yeah, it's working. I have yeah. th those like those physical games where you have like the you actually can feel like the components are always I think pretty good entry games. Um, some some month ago, I don't remember the name of the game, but basically you had like those small construction pieces, and then had to balance like work uh, like construction workers on that. That was. Uh, fantastic game like small board game with has like more dexterity based board game with has like more dexterity based and that's like uh really interesting for like beginners or like kids and everything if it has like a physical feel to it yeah. oh i looked it in bgg uh, i don't remember the name <laughs> then <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the advantage with the Azure printed, they're, they're not stickers that you could uh, take off, so you really feel that your game is durable. Yeah, it's uh, definitely a recommend for the Azure family from us, I think, all, almost across the board. Um, you know, David hasn't had a chance to play it yet, but uh, I do hope you do. Oh, so, I can't, uh, the... no? All right, well, now it's time to take a short break and uh, just a little bit of self-promotion here for us. Uh, the Last Standy now has a Patreon where you can come and support us if you want to. Uh, it is uh, located at um, patreon.com, www.patreon.com forward slash the slash the last standy. Um, same as the title. So that's uh, standy with two E's. Uh, should also be in the description for this episode. Um, there are two tiers. You can just give us a $1 a month support just to say, hi, thanks, we enjoy the podcast. Or you can have a $5, uh, five euro, sorry, euros, I'm so used to saying, euro, sorry, euros, I'm so used to saying dollars. Dollars, um, dollars. Is it dollars? It's in euros on mine. Um, uh, anyway, uh, there's two two tiers. The second tier will have a few extra sort of bonus episodes and little bits of additional exclusive content and recording. Um, you, you, but you know, you don't have to. It'd be great if you do want to. Uh, we'd love to see you there. A few extra sort of bonus episodes and little bits of additional exclusive content and recording. Um, you, you, but you know, you don't have to. It'd be great if you do want to. Uh, we'd love to see you there. Um, but otherwise, thanks for listening on that front. And um, now I think it's time to move on to our second game. Um, this one's one. Now I think it's time to move on to our second game. Um, this one's one that I forced everyone to play over yeah. this period. Yep, because I wanted us to all have at least a bit of a discussion on it. Uh, and um, I'm going to go on a tiny bit of a tangent first and just take you all back to a time before S of his um, movie Duel was given uh, the... Um, director's chair to helm a thriller based on a book um now uh it's a very famous film it it created along with star wars the summer blockbuster genre and some of you already should be aware of what this is it is of course the drama horror movie um which about a small holiday island um called amity island being menaced by a abnormally large great white shark uh, the film itself um, takes place in two acts. The first half is on uh, Amity Island. And basically, uh, th this is one of those films that, for me at least, it it's aged really well. Now, it's obviously very dated looking, but the societal message, especially in the first half, just feels very relevant. We've got an island where there's a shark attack and people are being killed. And the chief of police is like, we've got to close the beaches. We've got to close. He's like, we've got to close the beaches. We've got to close the beaches. And the politician, the mayor is like, no, no, it's bad for us. It's bad for tourism. The shark is a hook, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> yes. And uh, it's it's quite sort of interesting how the, this whole all plays out. You get a lot of drama, a lot of scenes with um, the family. To you get to know these scenes with um, the family. To you get to know these three characters, and then they go out to sea to try and deal with the shark once for all. And the movie just sort of changes context. And instead of being island based, all of a sudden it's just three men. It's out on a on on a boat on the orca alone at sea, trying. To, to do their best to figure out how to best to figure out how to deal with a shark bonding and so on it's uh it, for, for me at least um i first saw this film in the in the cinema 
um, my local cinema in Cardiff, back when I lived in the UK, every once in a while they'd go back and show um, old classic movies. So they show Gremlins, Die Hard, uh, The Thing, um, and Jaws was one of those that I went to see. And I saw one of the original film recordings they put up in one of the older screens, so from the original sort of reels, showed it with a whole load of people who most of them, I think, had seen it before many times, and I watched it for the first time, and I was like, "Oh my goodness, this is! I'm glad I saw this! I'm glad I saw this in the cinema because that was a heck of an experience. It was like people were silent, quiet throughout almost the whole thing, um, burst into applause at the end, and you know, wow! I, I don't know what it'd have been like if I'd seen it first on the small screen on a, like a little television or something, but it latched on me." It's been around for quite a while. It launched Steven Spielberg's career and made him everything he is. Um, John Williams was one of the first films he scored with uh, Steven Spielberg, and his um, his musical score is it, it really does a lot to um, sell the movie. It's an iconic theme. So yeah, the game briefly, and then we'll have a discussion about it, and then we'll talk about the second half. So the first half is a hidden movement game with one versus three. Um, this is much like Scotland Yard or Garibaldi or Fury of Dracula um, or Spectre Ops or Nuns on the Run. Games like that. Enjoy these, although it can be exceedingly stressful playing the hidden movement side. So one side plays a shark, the other side plays the crew. This means the game's for technically for one to four, uh, for two to four players. You could play more if people wanted to play as a committee, um, but I don't know what that would be like. However, I've played this with two. Technically, for one to four, uh, for two to four players, you could play more if people wanted to play as a committee. Um, but I don't know what that would be like. However, I've played this with two, I've played this with three, I've played this with four, and it just holds up on all all scales. It's most interesting at two player and four player, but three can be very exciting. It's most interesting at two player and four player, but three can be very exciting. So, on a turn, first thing that happens is uh, everyone sets up and the um, you draw from the Amityville deck and this tells you a random event that happens and where the swimmers turn out on the various beaches on this tight board. Um, there's a north, south, east and west beach and a certain number appear at each. Then the shark gets to have their go. They've got three actions. They do it all secret. So they, um, they can move for an action or they can eat a swim for an action and they've got four powers that they can play uh, that will... Um, allow them to break the little bit. Basically, though, they have to do everything hidden and record their final location on a sheet, note how many swims have been eaten, then take them off the board. That After that, it's time for the crew to have their go. All three of them can play in any order, but they have to do their entire turn in one go. And the asymmetry continues because each of the three, three crew characters have a different set of abilities. Brody, Captain Brody, is stuck on the island. He's the police chief. He doesn't get in boats, so or at least not at this stage. So all he can do, uh, the same as anyone, he can rescue swimmers at a beach. So if he goes to a beach where there's swimmers for one action, he can say, "Oh, you get off the beach." Um, then we have uh, uh, he has the ability to buy to pick up barrels from the shop and take them to docks and drop them off. The barrels are important for Quint, and we'll get to him last. Uh, he can also, if he's on a beach, use his binoculars, one action, once a turn. He can have a look at the sea uh, of the beach there, water next to the beach there. If the shark is present, the shark has to say, hey, I'm there, and pop its cool little wooden sharky token on the board, and hey, he spotted the shark. And last of all, if there's no swimmers on a beach, he can close the beach. He puts a token on that says beach closed. It's just like the one in the film. Um, and that stops the next spawning of swimmers, and it'll flip to a beach opening soon, and then we'll come back on. So Brody can basically close an area of the board off to make it easier for everyone to figure out where the shark is because there's no food in one area. Then we have Hooper. Hooper is the oceanographer. Uh, he rides around in a cool speedboat. He gets to move two spaces a turn, but he can only be in the water. Hooper uh, is allowed to pick up barrels in the water and from docks, but can't drop them into the water. Hooper has to give them to Quint. Hooper's other ability is a fish finder. Um, basically, you can play it once a turn, put it in the space he's in. If the shark player, if Bruce the shark is in that space, he has to reveal, or they have to reveal. It might be Sheila. Sometimes it's. I mean, actually, um, just as an aside, according to the film, um, the size of the great white shark in the film 
it would likely be a female shark, um, even though it's abnormally big, but the female great whites are larger than the males. So you have to find another name than Bruce. Sheila. She- Sheila's the, the, the name that Greg dubbed uh, his shark when he played as, as the shark player. <laughs> that is a good uh, shark It name. is, yeah. It, 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 was, it was quite entertaining to, to be horribly mauled by Sheila, I can tell you. Um, then, uh, uh, sorry, so where was he? Oh, yes, um, his fish finder. So Hooper throws his fish finder in the water space. Again, the same as the binoculars. But also, they do if they're not in that space, but they're adjacent, they have to say, I'm in the area, I'm adjacent. And that gives more indicators. Not exactly where the shark is, but narrows it down to like three or four different squares that the shark could be in. Finally, we have Quint. Now, Quint is the, the wind mechanism. Quint is the, the wind mechanism for the crew. Quint has a boat as well, can only ride around in the sea. Quint can pick up barrels um, and fire them into either the space that Quint is in or an adjacent space. If they land on the space the shark is in, they're taken off the board and attached to the shark. Two barrels on the shark, and that's the end of the phase. The space that Quint is in or an adjacent space. If they land on the space the shark is in, they're taken off the board and attached to the shark. Two barrels on the shark, and that's the end of the phase. The other way that the phase ends is if the shark eats nine swimmers. The barrels have another use. If they're in the water, floating around, and the shark moves through the space, they're in the water, floating around, and the shark moves through the space, these sharks have mo- these barrels have motion detectors on them, and the shark has to say, I have been in this space where the barrel is, usually in my case by shaking it a little and going boop, 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 or something other you know, fun sound effect, because what's the point of being the shark if you're not going to make some fun sound effects? Some fun sound effects. Um, so that that's that's essentially the first half. It will end if the shark eats nine swimmers. It'll end if the shark gets two barrels. I found initially for new players, often the shark tends to hit nine swimmers because people are not used to the map, but the map is so close and tight that when you get experienced, it becomes two different experiences with or three different experiences with playing this on the numbers. Yeah. I believe, Alessio, you guys actually, um, the, the crew managed the job, didn't they? Yeah, I actually managed to get the shark just eight five swimmers. This is the face I like most, mostly because in the Act 2, uh, <laughs> that aside, what happened is that the shark played very, very cleverly. So uh, I basically outsmarted the shark, which is uh, a nice thing to do about myself. The shark can actually swindle you and it can do it easily and you have the means to understand that but uh, is the way you can win so th- that's uh, a really a really nice and and uh, well thought uh, duel of minds here so yeah that's how it went i do apologize it seems there's a shark outside our house as our dog is uh, barking at it <laughs> yeah <laughs> hey, it's all right <laughs> Yeah. And anyway, anyway, I have to say that uh, I found Brody completely useless, and it was not <laughs> entirely its his fault. But the the first time he managed to close a beach, I drew the event Fourth of July. Open all beaches fault, but the the first time he managed to close a beach, I drew the event Fourth of July. Open all beaches and put the swimmers over there. Yeah. I'd, I'd agree. In the first half, Brody does have kind of the um, very like grunt work job, um, but the binoculars and and the and, and the beach closure can be quite good. Um, I typically, if I'm going to play crew with new people, I'll play Brody though because he um, it's more fun being out at sea firing the barrels and using the fish finder. I find. <laughs> In our own game, it was like herding cats. Uh, the swimmers were just going to every... Even though there were already eight people that had been eaten by the, the Great White, they were still happy to go into the beaches. I'm sure that says nothing about society currently during this pandemic. You you want that bad. <laughs> the, the game which uh, I, I taught David and Audrey, I, I played as um, as the shark. And the very first thing that happened is that Michael Bro uh, and then and then f- several other swimmers turned up in the same spot. So I just swam over there and scored like f- five points in a yeah, single exactly. turn <laughs> just by feeding frenzy in them all. And that kind of set the tone. The first half was very difficult for them after that because I made so much progress. But they did get a barrel on me. <laughs> nice. Also, Grimson Waters. Also, I have to say, like I played Brody, and damn, that was like cruel. 
<laughs> he he stuck his legs in the water. He swung swung them around. He even put like turkey basting on them. How what am I supposed to do if a if a kid does that? He's saying, "Eat me, please." Yeah, it was just we didn't we we were too too far to be able to do anything at that point. Yeah, I I took a barrel for doing it, but I figured it was a good trade to get halfway up my track for you guys getting halfway up your track. Um, I did have to spend a few powers to move on, though. So, uh, right. Now we'll talk about the second half, which takes place on the Orca. Half. So the better the shark does, the more shark cards it has, the better that the crew do, the more crew cards they have. A thing I like about this is it turns out that these cards are... They're not powerful as such as they give you more options. So even in games I've played where the shark has had the full suite of cards, these cards are... They're not powerful as such as they give you more options. So even in games I've played where the Shark has had the full suite of cards and gone in with 10 cards, a ton of powers, it hasn't made it too much of a difference. It's been close and they've still... Um, it, the, the crew powers. It hasn't made it too much of a difference. It's been close and they've still... Um, the, the crew has still succeeded. In fact, the game I played against uh, David and Audrey uh, came down to... There were three three bites left on the boat and uh, I died and I'd even eaten Audrey at that point as Hooper you know it was really close yeah so um right let's just describe it you uh you flip your board over and on the back side shows um a picture of the orca sunk not you know not to make you feel too pessimistic about the situation but it's just that's the default state you then lay tiles on top that are double-sided and they either show the orca fully intact or the section damaged it's a bit like a, a miniatures battle game in some ways with a little bit of deduction but uh, i'll walk through each phase so first thing that happens is you draw three cards and they tell you the potential areas the shark's going to surface in, A, B, and C. And they tell you how much evade, which is like armor points the shark will have. If it's able to shake um, attachments that the crew have stuck to it, they're like, they work like debuffs, dealing damage or causing problems for the shark. So the shark may be encouraged to go to a place with a shake off symbol. And finally, they show how much damage uh, the shark potentially could deal with how many dice it gets to roll, one, two, or three. Then the shark has to pick two or three. Then the shark has to pick one of those three and place a token to say, that's where I'm going, face down, uh, and also potentially play a power card to do something extra after. And then the crew now decide and, and talk. Um, and that's kind of the fun deducing part of this is you're trying to work out where and, and talk. Um, and that's kind of the fun deducing part of this is you're trying to work out Where's the most beneficial portion for the shark to go to? Where should each of us be? What should we do? And each of the crew have different weapons. That some of them have ranged weapons that can be fired once, or maybe more if they have ammo. But all of them have they have ammo. But all of them have a different melee weapon. I, I like how all three of the melee weapons work and cover different situations. Once they've decided, they will stand somewhere and they'll attack. And the the scary thing about attacking is if you're attacking with a melee weapon, you can only attack adjacent water, which means typically you've got to be standing on the boat piece the shark is attacking, at least early on. And if the shark destroys that boat piece, you're falling in the water and it's going to get a free bite on one of you. So you have this extra kind of, ooh, do I, do I go there? Oh, I'm a bit injured. And gradually as the boat gets damaged, the outline changes and more spaces become available for you to target. Then, after the after you, all that happens you get to attack first then the shark attacks and then if you're in the water the shark gets to attack again gets to attack again um it's a very simple flow i like a lot of this game and i think that is fantastic in respect to this game is how it's not rules heavy the character sheets tell and do the cards are quite clear and as i said i like how all three characters have a different basic weapon that functions differently under certain circumstances um, brody has a baseball bat it rolls two dice but if you miss you get to roll again in contrast hooper has a hammer ignores evade so whatever he, whatever hooper rolls on the dice is how much boom. um and quint probably has the scariest of the three and that he has a machete that always deals one uh, hit and then gets another couple but in co in compensation um quint doesn't start with a gun so i like this second half i've yet to have a second half where it's been a stomp one side or the other so on a game like this every dice roll i'm kind of excited about 
it's, it, there's never just rote rolling dice. It always feels like each dice roll matters and is doing something significant. So how about how do you guys feel about this? I, I know, Alessio, you said uh, that you prefer the first half more. Uh, yeah, basically that that happened because the shark. Wa- feel about this? I I know, Alessio, you said uh, that you prefer the first half more. Uh, yeah, basically that that happened because the shark won this time. And uh, one thing uh, I think it's worth mentioning is that when you uh, have to declare it, when you attack, uh, you have to declare the target of the attack before the shark to declare the target of the attack before the shark reemerges. And uh, in this case, I completely sucked at deciding where the shark would be. So I lost by orca destruction. It managed, but he pulled the, basically the good powers to like uh, do twice an attack to the bot, but then mm. it was downhill. Yeah, when we played, um, I, I can't remember when I played with Alexis um, too, too much. I know it got really close. We did take Greg down in the end, didn't we, Alexis? Yeah, uh, I think that in the end the shot won, but not by uh, how it ended. Um, no, yeah. no, no, I, 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 I can't remember because it's a while ago. But I thought, I th- thought I managed to kill him with the hammer, but maybe not. I played a few games with Greg, so it's hard to remember. I do remember with Audrey and, and David, I, I lost, um, and I only just lost as well, which was pretty exciting. Yeah, it was pretty close. Even though our flair we attached to you was like shark friendly and environment friendly, mm. and <laughs> but it, it, we it, had. And we had to use uh, Cooper as a as chum pretty much, but otherwise it was like really <laughs> yeah. balanced. <laughs> yeah. F- Fanny, Paul... you lost to an experience at the sailor anyway. Mm. Yeah. F- Fanny, Paul... you lost to an experience at the sailor anyway. Mm. Even though I got eaten in the second phase, uh, I preferred the second phase to the first one because uh, to me, the idea of having the three resurface cards and you know that the shark is going to resurface at one, and you know that the shark is going to resurface at one of these was a bit more instinctive to understand where the shark was going to go than uh, there are swimmers. And the shark was there the previous time, etc. Because uh, when there are the swimmers, you are also depending on where you were before. While for the second phase, appear anywhere from anywhere. Certainly, yeah. Yeah, it, it does narrow the options down a bit more. Um, and there's a, a little bit of chance. I got a bit um, done in le- during the later stages because the cards kept popping up and they'd be like, this card's definitely on the boat and these two are over where there's no boat left. So we know where Fen's going to be. Yeah, it becomes easier as the boat gets damaged. Yeah. It does. I like that as well, though. It kind of you know, Initially, you're like, oh, God, God it's the three locations. We better spread out our attacks. And then it sort of tightens down. And as things get to the very much the why, you're sort of very concentrated but also you're more vulnerable is not a good idea i really like that both um aspects of the game are different types of um uh, hidden decisions even though they're both really different uh one is more about bluff while the other is um i guess tactical analysis yeah <laughs> um and i because both uh, sides use the same sort of gameplay mechanics. The whole game feels very coherent, mm. uh, coherent yep. despite being uh, really different from one phase to the other. Yeah, so this game is, I'm just looking now at the site. This game's from um, Prospero Hall, is the um, a collaborative Seattle-based design group. Uh, it was published by Ravens. Um, it's a very cheap game as well. It's not expensive. It looks great, and it has a fairly small footprint physically. So um, I, I think that... I am incredibly impressed with this game, um, and I, I do think more people should be having a look at it because, yeah, it takes these mechanics, and they, they're good because, yeah, it takes these mechanics, and they, they're good mechanics. They're interesting, they're tense, and um, it creates effectively two mini games that you play that f- cover the story of the film, let you retell it in a new fashion. And when you get used to it, this game's pretty fast to run through. Like, 60 minutes is easily new fashion. And when you get used to it, this game's pretty fast to run through. Like, 60 minutes is easily, you can have it done in, depending on how much you want to chat about your decisions. And you can explain the the rules in five minutes. You can, yeah. You you really can. There's only a couple of times you have to refer back to the rulebook just to be, like, absolutely certain about a a couple of things. things. But it's... uh, 
I think it is considering it came out in 2019, so long after the film, it's just a bit of a statement to the um, long-lasting impact that this this film has had, and uh, and, and I, I do think it's a masterpiece in that front of design. You know, it's just first and second act, and actually, I would have overlooked that if I weren't forced to play it. So, actually, thank you because it was a fun game. Yeah, well, I, I thought it got up fairly well because it did um it, it did have like a Golden Geek Best Thematic nominee in the year it came out, and it had a Parents Choice recommended nominee in the year it came out, and it had a Parents Choice recommended as well. Although you know, yeah. uh, maybe you want to wait a while before you let your kids watch the film if you're going to do that because it did cause a lot of <laughs> a lot of fear and and concerns about the um about sharks. It's still sharks still have a bit of a bad reputation because of this movie still have a bit of a bad reputation because of this movie yeah despite uh not killing uh almost anybody i think that, that last year they killed two people worldwide um it's really not a dangerous uh animal no it isn't i think there's one place um off the coast of europe i forget exactly where it is where you're banned from swimming because there's an abnormal number of shark attacks due to the type of sharks there but that's about it okay, for the most part a great whites are terribly um not likely to attack so anyway um jaws i think gets my full recommendation it's one of my favorite movie recreation games um and um, i do hope i can convince everyone here to try out some some other hidden movement games in the future because uh they're, yeah, they're one of my, I, I love those kind of uh, mechanics um uh, and jaws jaws is interesting because the board is so tight as you see when we play some of the others they're played on a bigger board with more spaces that the hidden character could be in and uh, the, the deduction is quite interesting and how the reveal mechanics work to give you info are pretty pretty neat scotland yard is probably the purest of those we'll have a look at that if we ever can do an IRL uh, meetup we definitely should try to play captain sauna Yes, yes, Captain Sonar is one I forgot to talk about. I haven't had a chance to chance to properly play that. Captain Sonar is a total mess. I love it. <laughs> it, it is an incredible mess. It's not playable through uh, online, I think. Yeah, no, absolutely not. It's a hot mess. That's what we like. Okay. A hot mess during the Cold War. Right, so let's um, let's move on from Jaws to uh, Mokborg with uh, Alexis and David. So uh, who's going to take the lead on this one? Tell us all about it. So Mokborg is a Swedish role-playing game in the OSR genre that was um, published on Kickstarter first uh, through a pretty uh, successful campaign. Uh, I'll quickly explain what uh, OS in role-playing games uh, that distinguish themselves from the modern role-playing game by going back to a softer, less rule-heavy type of tabletop games. It's mostly started after the fourth edition of D&D, as some players disliked the amount of stats, special skills, abilities, and game aspect that fell from the role-playing side of the game. Uh, usually OSR games are going to be more lean with very quick character creation, not too many dice roll and a very straightforward challenge res resolution. So you will just have a DC to, to beat rather than having to make uh, any complicated map or use your skill or having to make uh, any complicated map or use your skill or traits, it's usually going to be pretty straightforward. Usually hyping up the, the first and second edition of uh, D&D, Two of the big names uh, are either uh, Old School Essentials, which was a Kickstarter, a Kickstarter collection of rules, uh, are either uh, Old School Essentials, which was a Kickstarter, a Kickstarter collection of rules that feels very plug and play. Uh, so you have different book and you can uh, easily just add, oh, this, this book adds a priest class, this book adds uh, rules for fantasy, this book adds rules for modern. And it kind of tries to be like GURPS, but a more D&D inspired. The other one would be Lamentation of the Flame Princess, known for its violent and colorful adventures. It's, it has a bunch of different genre, but it very much feels like the, the second edition of D&D. OSR games usually have um, very interesting tables to general loot. When games are meant to be played with uh, almost no preparation. Uh, and Mokbok is an OSR game in the sense that its rules uh, set is extremely simple. Your character is made of, of four stats. Uh, you have a, a pool of health and you have some equipment. 
and if you want to play with the different and that's it uh, after you decide that you're thrown into the world and you might upgrade your character but probably won't uh, because the game's uh, setting is uh, very uh, we are going to say very harsh a long time ago uh, a bad prophecies about the end of the world and uh, one day the sun disappears and every prophecy that the basilisk made uh, starts to come true uh, and so there's always a time limit before the end of the world and whenever you play a game of mockbook it's uh, with that uh, usually uh, you want to be uh, to finish your game as the world just ends in flame uh, the different prophecies are all very fun you have like a little table that looks like a um, like Bible passages that predict of the different uh, calamities that will fall into the world. I can just pick my book and read one, just pick my book and read one uh, randomly. Um, the tree shall wither, drivel and die. Another one. In the hearth of Sakarf, uh, dusk and fog shall breathe beneath the walking tree. So always uh, fun little things that happen so always uh, fun little things that happen into the world and start um, messing with the players um, what will mostly happen is that you are going to play a very short adventure that will be very um, dungeon crawling or uh, just vi just violent little uh, scaffold as your character are probably not going to survive too long since it's already the end of the world um, but the most important aspect of Monkbok, it's probably the way it looks. Uh, the game manual is just a beautiful work of art with lots of very vibrant colors and some, uh, some page being entirely taken by one image with a little bit of text uh, twisting and turning around the, art the artwork because the artwork and the look of the book is uh, very much at the center of it. Yeah. Um, some RPG books are a little bit dry, but this isn't it. Uh, it values stars. This is why I love it. It's also a great game for short session uh, or one shot evening. And that's my introduction. So for me personally, the, like the standout is, first of all, it's like uh, <clears throat> has like this death metal, doom metal look. It's all like totally over the edge, and yeah, it's like <laughs> just a fun, fun RPG. Like everything is like completely, um, like yeah, over over the edge, as I said. Um, it goes from like uh, the artwork, the design, like the physical book. Physical book is like it's it's like fantastic. It has like like imprints. It has like uh, special special like pages where you have like some kind of uh, like this reflective foil on it. There's also glow in, glow in the dark uh, letters on the outside of the book, so it just looks very outside of the book, so it just looks very fantastic in general. What personally, what I feel like, there's a lot of dark humor involved. Like you have those tables, uh, like for looting corpses. You have tables for like uh, special things that your character might carry, and it just oozes like carry, and it just oozes like this dark humor in every corner yeah uh the book really oozes uh style and um and cool aspects for example here i'm just going to pick up the occult treasure table read one at random ash gray ring a finger wide uh, a finger ring all that passes through is obliterated that's fun to find on a corpse you find a ring you try to put it on and you lose your finger yeah <laughs> but there's a lot of fun little traps in the game yeah it doesn't really care about balance at all because it's like meant as a sh short term game but it's like also the fun part like <laughs> you will test i think you're will... going to play for a few short evening that will be very uh cool and colorful and fast and by the end of it you'll your most interesting stories will be either how you completely uh gold some monster or how your character got um died in in terrible way or got maimed yeah, there are it's a lot of slight nods also to like classical games like Warhammer. Like one of the random items you could get is like a small wishes dog. Then you have like this uh, kind of fumbles if you try to use powers, which is like similar to magic. 
and a lot of weird things can happen if something goes wrong. A lot of weird things can happen if something goes wrong. Yeah. Um I I was wondering if um any of you played some uh, OSR games or like uh enjoy this the 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 movement the sort of uh, indie movement that's going counter to the most recent um RPGs. Uh, like I was saying, I am actually old school myself, so I actually played the, <laughs> the original games. But yeah, I, I am actually pretty fond of the genre. Actually, I I'm not playing a lot of uh, role playing games anymore. But uh, what I, what I love to do is to take a manual, uh, read it, uh, and take a manual, uh, read it, uh, and uh, read it for the rules and for the settings. So games which play in an evening and uh, allow you to explore and uh, especially when when in a game it's fun to fail that's actually an added value so i am actually that's actually an added value so i am actually pretty fan of the concept of the movement well i think that uh, morgbok would be perfect for you because it's really a game where you can just pick it up you don't really need to prepare anything you can just throw a uh, an adventure super easily they actually in uh, one of the um, uh, kickstarter that they made one of the things that they uh, gave out was like a pamphlet sized uh, dungeon it's like a, an a4 page that just um, that has been folded and so you have just like a few sides that explain the dungeon that give out the trap the monsters and you can throw that to your player and you'll have a fun either succeed or die but it, everybody will have fun um, and because of the game, making a character is so fast and easy, you basically have to roll like three dice and then you're, you're done with it. You can really just have a character dying and then having another character join up the adventure and within a, a few minutes you into the action. And it's just fun. Um, it's, a, it's a really fun little thing. Yeah, it's also worth mentioning that the the Kickstarter page for the original project is actually a good point to look at the goodness. Then you go to the official site of Morgborg and you see of Morgborg and you see that there is even more because actually the project is uh, fully described and it's teased correctly on the Kickstarter so you get interested. Then when you know what the system is capable of you just go to the official site of Morkborg and you actually are and you actually are overwhelmed by the community response and the stuff that there is there yeah uh if anybody likes um uh heavy rock metal and that kind of stuff uh, on their kickstarter i think that they link towards their spotify playlist that is just full of a uh, uh, really juicy music that uh really fits within the the theme of the game yeah i was listening to that before recording that's a playlist <laughs> yeah um what about you fan do you uh, do you enjoy usually uh, osr games i know that when you play uh, rpg games you usually focus on something that's more about the role playing and the playing and the um the fun aspect of it. Yeah, I'm. Um, well, we're. I'm a long campaign player, um, and I have very few systems I really enjoy playing. So one-off scenarios aren't normally the kind of thing I, I, I play at all. Um, I mean, my essentially my essentially my role-playing collection is Seventh Sea, both editions, uh, Woofrup, all four editions, um, and uh, Call of Cthulhu. Um, we're um, we're playing Call of Cthulhu right now, uh, and so much so that we've gone two sessions without rolling a single dice. Just to give you an idea how. Um... Well, although you don't roll that many dice in uh, in Morgbok, it's just um, but definitely more than Call of Cthulhu. Yeah, I, I grew up on um, Woofrup. Um, I got my hands back when uh, a bunch of like secondhand um, uh, first edition native style of play i'm very much somebody who doesn't i think combat is not really what i'm looking for in the game and so that's what i'm like when i run it yeah um, in call of cthulhu if you end up rolling dice usually it means bad things yeah we'll, we'll throw <laughs> up is um we'll have a fancy role play for those who uh, aren't not aware of this so usually it means bad things yeah we'll, we'll throw <laughs> up is um we'll have a fancy role play for those who uh, aren't not aware of the acronym Wolfrup was originally pitched as, can we take Call of Cthulhu and do it in the Warhammer world? So it's a bit more, 
a um, bit more combat orientated and very lethal without your exo it's a bit more a um, bit more combat orientated and very lethal without your extra lives given to you in fate points but yeah that's as close as i get like um I, I, with D D and things like that um i'm very much i just get switch off and just stop paying attention which is terrible um cool. um I, I had a look at the guardian actually did an article on Morkborg, um and really they did, yeah of all places yeah of all places yeah they did it in um, august and covered it and um, very much played up on the aspect of how it tributes to swedish swedish metal um swedish death metal was it uh, one of the designers or something i'm not sure exactly. yeah, yeah um and the the original title of uh Morg book is also um uh it's swedish i think it's something like dark tower or something mm. like that uh, so, so something that sounds very old school uh speaking of one thing that is uh nice to mention is that the uh <laughs> yeah, 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 sorry. I, I should have said yeah. Um yeah. I, I do I can actually translate this. My Swedish is there. Um it, yeah, it's um Dark Castle or Dark Fortress. There's a few ah. books around here, so yeah. Ah, there we go. It's a, a, that international podcast finally uh <laughs> paying off. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So so yeah, the, the layout has been made by uh, Patrick Stewart, which is uh, uh, a guy that is well known into the um, the indie uh, tabletop RPG scene. Uh, he makes some really cool um, books and interesting uh, tables, well, full of um, books and interesting uh, tables, well, full of uh, really cool monsters. I've used a few of them uh, in uh, in some of my own uh, tabletop RPG. Uh, one of the monsters created in the in the book um, Fire on the Velvet Horizon is um, um, a phoenix that only exists once and that transcends multiple uh, games that he, he encourages you to bring into like your uh, Call of Cthulhu game and then your um, uh, D and D games, and that they all sort of relate together in some strange. Uh, d- there's some really interesting concepts. Um, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Just before we we finish, I think that uh, today is actually a very special day for Monkbox, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. They're they're actually going to start another Kickstarter. They had one before for Van Fanzine, but like uh, community gathered and then refined content. They did one, I think, in last October or something. And now they are doing something similar again. Uh, but this time it's, it's the Kickstarter includes the uh, Game Master screen. And I think there will be like some kind of, uh, maybe some kind of special content for it. Like I think it w- won't be exclusive for the Kickstarter because like you can um, order the fanzines and pretty much everything from their website. Uh, but it will be interesting. They are going to start, uh, the Kickstarter is going to start tonight at, I think, 7 o'clock or something. Yeah, exactly. Basically, since you said today, it is important to say that the day of the recording is uh, 14th of January. Oh, yep, sorry. Uh, yeah. You've, you've time dated us. You've stamped us. Yeah. <laughs> That's a recording no-no. It's not as if I could have cut it in uh, editing. <laughs> I'm really looking forward for that Kickstarter and it will be interesting. Yeah, me too. I'm uh, I'm excited. I think that the name of the Kickstarter is a Mork Book Cult Erratic, uh, which always very um, image, as we say in French. Yeah, I think there will be like they said there will be some like four kinds of dif- uh, four different gods, as we say in French. Yeah, I think there will be like they said there will be some like four kinds of dif- uh, four different gods, which might take like uh, give you some kind of like new background. I think it feels like it feels Ooh, like that interesting. Way. Okay, all right. Well, um, it sounds very interesting, even though it's not my. It sounds very interesting, even though it's not my cup of tea. Uh, I, I certainly, when I read about it and had a look at the reviews and everything, it seemed uh, pretty unique. And um, yeah, well, we will be back in two weeks with some more. So um, just to say, as before, you can catch us on um, Patreon at the Last Standee or on Twitter. Uh, them as we go. So, um, first of all, thank you very much, everyone, for being here. Um, and uh, Alexis, where can everyone catch you? People can catch me on Twitter at Xelia Sammy and find my credential on our Patreon or our Discord. 
Yep, we'd have a Discord now as well. Uh, Alessio, is there anywhere else special that people can catch you? Patreon? Uh, yeah, it's Teclis uh, everywhere with a three instead of the he. All right, David. Um, you could can catch me via Discord or via Reddit. Uh, yeah. the, the profile it's Captain Yar with three R's. R. <laughs> mm -hmm. And yeah, that's pretty much the best way. To R. <laughs> mm -hmm. And yeah, that's pretty much the best way to contact me if you want. Yeah, the extra R is very important. Audrey. Yeah, you can find me as uh, millennia underscore minis on Instagram. Okay, uh, well, that's time for us to all say goodbye then. So uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, Alessio. Bye. And Alexis. From Belgium, goodbye. And from myself, goodbye and have a very good uh, rest of...